I'd like to ask Brother Bill Adams to come and pray over the message and over all of our hearts, well, myself included, because I am also a recipient of the message. Amen. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for your greatness, for you are who you are, and there is no one above you. Thank you. And Lord, you have created us and written upon all of our hearts your hopes, your desires for our life, which is only for good ever. Lord God, we pray this morning that you would open the eyes of our heart. God, to hear your word, to hear your voice. Lord God, that you would bless Brother Jesse, that you would send your words out from him. Lord God, that he would be the light that has been cultivated from your life, from the fellowship of your spirit. Yes. And Lord God, this day we pray that you would open our hearts to hear and open our minds to do all that which we hear from you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Bill. title of today's message is Peace Through Sanctification. I'm kind of picking up um, last month. We had some extended, uh, some visiting pastors come in, so we extended our messages out into this month. This is the last message from last month talking about, you know, working with one another and unity in the family, especially with our youth. So the theme for this month right now, sanctification is the month we're in. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I, and I pray God for your whole spirit and soul and body to be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the verse from today, for today is, but if you bite and devour one another, Galatians 5.15, if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed of one another. Spiritual cannibals, huh? <laughs> the world is in a lot of turmoil right now. A lot of anger, a lot of division, a very heated and emotional election here in the USA, upheaval in various governments around the world, well, war in Ukraine, war in Israel. Plenty of things to argue and be angry about. But where does God and his church fit in all this? A few scriptures I want us to keep in mind dealing with each other and those outside the church. Luke chapter 6, verse 45, A good man out of good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Your heart will always tell on you with your mouth. You ever had a sibling always go tell on you before you get to your mom and dad <laughs> and tell on them? And that's what your mouth does about your heart. It's, it just comes out. It's natural. And First Peter says, verse 315, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts Amen. and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks if you are questioned of reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. Sanctify CNN or Fox in my heart so I can win them with my convictions. We tend to be bite and devour one another even with the scriptures, don't we? Well. To prove our points, to stand our ground, to say this is what God says, but it's really God in it. Being in HR, sometimes a it can be challenging, especially if you have to work with the disagreements among various areas of HR. We have a whole recruiting section that's got like 250 HR professionals. And another smaller section, the technical review, which review everything and send everything off the last people. And they're always fighting amongst one another. Always arguing. And I always have to remind them because they come to QA to settle the disputes. We are customers of each other first. We are brothers and sisters of each other first well, in the church. 
How do, we how do we deal with those disagreements in the church? We must first have to realize where the disagreements come from. The world, right? James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. For once comes the wars and fightings among you. Where do they come from? Come they not even, hence even of your lust that war in your members? You lust and you have not. You kill and you desire to have. You cannot obtain, you fight, and you war, and you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. You are adulterers and adulterers. Know you not the friendship of the world is an enemy with God, and whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God? Whew. Are you batting for the enemy, or are you batting for God? Are you quarterbacking for the enemy? Or you're quarterbacking for God. Well. Who's the coach? Who's the owner, right? Oh, some messages preached this morning. Do you, this, do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit of God dwelleth in us to lust, lust to envy? Naturally, it's, that's the, the spirit that dwelleth, not the spirit of God, the spirit that dwelleth in us, our natural spirit, who we are naturally envies. Well. What was the first murder about? Envy jealousy of the brother right the very first family of God yes, so don't think that it's not going to happen in church sometimes but he giveth more grace wherefore he saveth he resisteth the proud but give a grace to the humble submit yourselves therefore unto God resist the devil and he will flee from you like we had to chase him out today right draw nigh to God and will draw an eye to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Most of disagreements come from lack of humility. I struggle with this. I think I'm always right. Well, Even with a great position in the VA, I'm always right. They're coming to me for the answers. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. When you think you stand, you're going to fall. But when you're humble, then you can stand by the grace and power of God. When we don't sanctify the Lord in our hearts and bring whatever it is that we've been carrying all week, it's just a matter of time before we explode. When we take on the world's view as a doctrine and try to fit it into fellowship, it just doesn't work. Fit it into our worship. Fit it into our preaching. Fit it into our teaching. It doesn't work. It doesn't fit. The Spirit of God will let be, get cleansed. The Spirit of God will, through your brothers and sisters, because they've sanctified their hearts before God, will call that out. We'll call that spirit of division. We'll call that spirit of anger. We'll call that spirit of wrath, the spirit of envy. It'll call that out. That's why in fellowship is one of the few places in Scripture it says, you are washed, you are purified by the blood of Jesus Christ Amen. in fellowship. So that powerful thing you were talking about, fellowship, men's fellowship Friday night, do you think, oh, it's just another men's fellowship going over some scriptures? There's some things that God does in your life in that moment of time that you give to him once a month. Amen. If you think you're just going to be going to church once a week and get everything you need, you're going to be pretty. You're going to be a pretty weak Christian. Amen. Every day. Paul said, I die daily, I've saved daily. Pastor Andy, the spirit, the, the spirit of God will let it cleanse out that angry podcast I listened to earlier today. Now, I, I like to listen to conspiracy stuff just, just for entertainment, just like everybody else, but sometimes that stuff just latches on to you, and it carries, your, it carries that anger into your work, it carries that anger into your family, it carries that, angry into your, that anger into your neighbors, Spills all over into your life. It's true. Men love darkness rather than light. We do. We are, we're attracted to darkness naturally. That spirit that's within us, it lusts to envy. It lusts to, to have things that we cannot have. We try to attain it. We can't have it because we're sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We don't want it. So it only comes through sanctification and humility. That preparing, sanctification is to kind of set yourself a, something aside for a specific pur purpose of specific use. 
Now, there's many ways you can sanctify yourself, like fellowship, time in the Word, worship, fasting, which we're going to talk a little bit about today, and just going out and sharing the love with the, that love with other people. There's this one guy in HR, he can never be wrong. He argues with everybody, even those who sit a couple, sit a couple doors down from the secretary to the VA who, who answers to the president. He argues with everybody. And I prayed, how do I work with this guy, Lord? How do I change? I can't change. The answer was from God. It says a soft answer turns away wrath. Works every time. Works every time. A lot of people just want to be heard. So when he comes with the one of them emails, dragging everybody into it and blasting everybody, I say, noted. I hear what you're saying, and you have a valid point, but have you considered this? Give us some time to research. And it's, he's actually now in our calls, when I train all the HR people in the month, he chimes in and says, well, have you considered this? Because he feels like a part of the team now. <laughs> so God has turned his heart. A soft answer turns away wrath. If you use the simple biblical principles, you can change a life. You can turn a life around. Works for me. Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hatred stirreth up stripes, but love covers all sins. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth the matter separateth very friends. Jim, could you grab that umbrella and open that for me? Someone standing out in the rain, you could sit there and point out to him, you're in the rain. Get out of the rain. Or you could be like this umbrella. And come over and stand beside him. Say, brother, I see you're in the rain, but is there anything I can do to help you? Can I have a prayer with you while we stand here under this umbrella? So as you're going through life, you know, instead of shouting at people and disp disputing with people, Maybe cover them with love. Cover them because the love covers a multitude of sin. We're all in the rain. We're all dealing with the struggles of life. But when you come over and you cover that brother with love and say, let me help you. I've been through what you've been through. I've been young before. I've been hurt before, I've been abandoned before, I've been misunderstood before. Thank you, Brother Jim. How do we treat one another? We're all wrong at times. We all disagree with one another at times. Can we look past that and forgive? I'll just go find another place to worship. Okay, you're going to carry that with you go wherever you go. If you don't learn to forgive here, wherever you go, even in Kentucky, if you're in Kentucky, if you carry an unforgiving spirit, it's going to be right there with you. Right. Amen? Right. So matter, no matter if you go, when you go to a ship next month out to sea, Brother Tony, you got to carry that with you out to that sea. Like Pastor Malcolm mentioned, it's a big wide sea in your one little soul. Get that alone time with God, but take the time to take that umbrella to people on that ship. Share that love. Let people see the light in you. Now we exhort you, brethren, Galatians chapter 5, beginning in, or just from verse 14. We exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Warn them, yes. Comfort them, support them, and especially be patient with them. You don't know what kind of struggle they're going through. They don't know what kind of struggle you're going through. But we're supposed to be the love that covers all that. Most won't be sanctified before they come in these doors, especially the first time. It's up to us to show that sanctification, to show that love, to let that light shine. How many people have come here and come here and come here again because of the love that's shown them? Not so much because of the music, and the music is great. I love worship with my brothers and sisters. But it was the love that was shown 
first one to another and then to them as they came. And they keep coming. Jesus said in John 13, 35, By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love to one another. But they're going to see if there's, the love's not there too. They're going to see if you're angry with your brother or your sister. They're going to see it quick. And they'll be like, I'm not coming back here. There's no love there. James chapter 3, beginning verse 13. Who is wise? Who is a wise man and do with knowledge among you? Let him show of a good conversation his work with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter, envying, and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For envying and strife is this confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. See, if you, can, you can always tell something's wisdom from God is how people are receiving it. If they're fighting you, that's not wisdom from above because it's easy. It's first pure. It's not choosing a side in the matter. It's pure. It's easy to be entreated. They're receiving it because God is dealing with their heart at the same time. And you're sharing with meekness and humbleness. You're not out there living another life. Who is that? Who is that? Oh, the people in church were living another life, right? The same life you were living. It's not doesn't have any hypocrisy. No partiality. That's wisdom in a, from above. That's how we deal with the times that we're living in right now. Not with fighting and arguing back and forth with people. Most of the time, I don't even say things when people get involved with those conversations. I don't even step in unless God says a specific time you need to say something. I noticed a post, a friend of mine who pastors a church in, in Florida, he posted a post that I felt was kind of controversial, very divisive, and people, were, and people in his church started fighting amongst each other. He caused a division by what he said, trying to make a point. And God told me to share the scripture where it talks about Jesus said, you think these, the people these tower fell on were more wicked than the rest of the people? No one said, he said, no, unless you repent, you're not going to be saved as well. So the point I was making to him and his church is we're all sinners. We all need to repent. So one of the tools that I struggle with and I'm getting better with is fasting. And it was really on my heart um, this week as I was preparing, I was talking to Pastor Alicia a little bit yesterday about it. And while I was here, I was talking about fasting. But not only the, the sacrifice of fasting, but what is the reward and the results of fasting? Because well, well. sometimes we try to focus so much on oh, the struggle. But if you focus on the struggle all the time, you're not going to have the joy of the prize of the set yes, before sir. you. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 58 beginning in verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Show the people my, their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways and a nation that forsook right, that did righteousness and for, forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask me the ordinance of justice. They take light, delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exact from all your labors. A true fast of God is you're going to anoint your head, wash your face, and get up and get out. Wash your face, anoint your head, and get up out there and go to work. Amen. You're not going to look like, oh, I'm so hungry, and they brought my favorite food to the potluck today. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell them I already had lunch because you've been spending time with the Lord. You fast for strife and debate, to smite with the fist of wickedness. You fast, you should not fast as you do in this day to make your voice to be heard on high. I'm not going to listen to you. Because you're fasting to debate, to fight, to prove your point. Amen. Is that a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul, to bow his head in a bull rush and spread staff cloth and ashes under him? Will that call fast an acceptable day unto the Lord? 
Now it's going to answer through questions. I like that how the Lord does that. He, through scripture, sometimes he'll ask you questions so you can kind of think of the answer yourself. Verse number six, is this not a fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free that you break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, to bring in the poor that are cast out of thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and when thou hide not, hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and then thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy rear reward. Then thou shalt call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here am I. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, the speaking vanity, if thou draw thy soul to the hungry, because when you, you deny yourself that food, you take up your cross and you deny the body those necessary needs, the nutrients, you're drawing out your soul to the hungry. And satisfy the afflicted soul. And then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a water garden, like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. So the results for others from fasting is loose the bands of wickedness. That's the, th the things that wicked people try to tie you up with. The things that the world try to tie you up could be your boss, could be a government official, could be the policeman, could be anything. If someone in authority is wicked, they're trying to tie you up with that wickedness. Could even be an old family member, could be your own parents. Undo heavy burdens, burdens men put on you, not God, because God's burden is light, right? Let the oppressed go free. Someone who has suffered violence or wrong, that's the oppressed. Break every yoke is a form of oppression, hard labor used on oxen to force them to work together. Deal thy bread to the hungry, to feed the word of God to people. Jesus is the bread of life, right? Bring in the poor that are cast out, it could be lost or restoration for some. Cover the naked, love covers a multitude of sins. It's shame, and it's usually obvious. The results for you, your light will break forth as the morning. Your health will spring forth speedily. Thy righteousness will go before you. Ever come into a situation, if you prayed and you've sanctified the Lord in your heart, and you felt like there was going to be a battle, but God went before you yes, and kind of calmed the waters and said, okay, there's no more battle here. Yes, sir. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rear reward. The signs that will follow those that believe. The real reward in, in battle in the Israelite army, there's always a group of men that were left behind to care for the wounded, to, to help those that are, have the broken bones, and to bury the dead. That's the real reward. So the glory of the Lord is our real reward, then those signs that follow us of believe are what? They will speak with new tongues. They will take up deadly serpents and it will not harm them. Any kind of doctrine that you hear, it's not going to harm you because you really got what you know is right. Are those signs following what we believe? Well, they can't. Let's talk a little bit about letting your light shine. Pastor Lee answered a question when he was here Wednesday night doing a Bible study. Do we have a little time if you don't come to Wednesday nights? After the Bible study, we give the audience time to talk, to ask the teacher questions. And someone was online, I believe, and asked a question. How do I see my friend or my family member get saved? He, was, he had a real strong de desire to see his family member get saved. And Pastor Lee's answer was a simple answer. Let your light shine. Let your light shine. It took six years from when I first got introduced to somebody in the church before I got saved before I believed, repented, went down in that watery grave, came up a new creature. Nobody can convince me other, any other ways before that time. Because we all have an appointed time when the day, the day the Lord visits us. And if we try to teach somebody into that tank before they're ready, they're just going to be a wet, wet baby, not a born-again Christian. 
How do you let your light shine? When COVID was, we're all hit, we're kind of, we all kind of stuck inside from COVID. Couldn't go outside and be with people and stuff. And Julia kept seeing the neighbors going to the teenage girls going into the, the door. And then she started knocking on the window and waving to them. And they'll wave back to her. After a while, she'd open the window and they'd come and talk to her and she'd talk to them. Then they began to read to her. And they would do little dances because they were in play, they were in theater. And she would do the little dances with them. So they were kind of the, our neighbor, her teens were being, letting their light shine to Julia, to being a good example of someone, a little girl that was maybe a little lonely. She needed some friendship. Now Julia takes that when she goes to the park, she sees a, a, young chi- a younger child that needs to be pushed. She'll go push them. Or say, or she'll go over and ask them if they're by themselves, you want to go play with them? And she'll go play with them. Which gives us an opportunity as the parents to kind of minister and share to the adults. She's letting her light shine so that we can let her light shine. So we can share people. I think she's a bigger evangelist than me sometimes. <laughs> Amen. What if, you're, uh, what if you're in high school? I know our teenagers are back in the study tonight. But what if you see somebody that always gets bullied and picked on? Can you go sit with them for lunch? Spend time with them? Let your light shine? Or are you going to be part of the crowd just picking on them? Or maybe you could forego your lunch, go form a little prayer group and pray for things at the school, pray for things in the government, together as students, young people. Well, you're allowed to do that. I mean, the teachers can't force prayer in the schools, but the kids can get together and pray. Nothing in the law that says anything about that. So you can do that. Maybe just take one or two to start. We all have the light in us. We also all also have the darkness. Jesus said darkness, men love darkness naturally better than light. We do. We tend to lean towards that darkness, so we got to get back to the light, sanctify ourselves, get that light back in us, and go back out and let the light shine. Maybe there's someone that needs help with their homework. They're struggling in math, and you're good in math. You could come alongside them and say, hey, let's talk to our parents. Maybe we can get together, and I can help you study. Maybe, who knows, maybe they'll get saved. But you're letting your light shine. Letting your light shine is not forcing it on them. I've heard it once said in a library, there's all kinds of books. And as you're walking by, the books aren't shoving themselves at you. Read me, <laughs> forcing themselves, you know, pushing you into the book. But it's there and available so you can just go pull and read. And that's how the light is in our life. It's You're there and available so people can just come to you and ask the questions. What do I need to do? How can I be saved? How can I put up with these people that are bullying me? I remember being bullied by a bunch of people. I didn't have clean clothes. I smelled bad. I didn't eat good food all the time, so I was a wreck. But a voice from heaven said, you'll be more successful than them all. I took that to heart. So even in those times that I dealt with some of that stuff, I would always remember that God said, I'm going to be more su-. Now, what's success in God's eyes? Well, well. <laughs> Is it being able to share the gospel with people or being able to show them the nice car you're driving? Well. Come on now. Well, God, success comes. I mean, I got a great job. I'm paying the bills. I'm thankful to be in business and do business with people, but everything leads to sharing the gospel with people for me. Every time I went to a house to share the business opportunity that I do with somebody, and they said, can you tell me about the parable of the sower? Totally changed every plan that I had about that day. But you know what? God was glorified because they were asking questions, and some of those same people were, in the, were at the party that we were at w- uh, with the Orlops on uh, Saturday, a young child's party that we were at. But they're still there. I know that God, that seed was planted. And they're still probably asking those questions. Maybe I'll be able to water it. Maybe somebody that's letting your light shine like the Orlips. I could, I could, when I came to that party, God directed me right where the table they were sitting at. It was just like a light was there. They weren't drinking like everybody else was doing. Although you can have a beer at people that's not going to, nobody's going to judge you for that. But how does that show to others now? Can I effectively minister if I'm just hanging out? And someone sees that. 
know him. Let your light shine. Amen. Okay, enough off that soapbox. I wanted to spend some time with Alex, who's now in a Dominican with his, with his wife. Uh, so I said, hey, I want to have some coffee. I want to have some fellowship with you. You know, Felt like I've, I've been a long time since I've been with the brother. And I said, oh, let's go. And he said, well, let's go meet at the mall. So we sat, we're sitting down, started sipping our cup in, and Alex is an evangelist. He's like thinking of where, where can I go meet some Navy sailors while I'm here? He said, Let's go, let's, let's, let's go meet some Navy sailors. So we start walking around, and I'm letting him lead because that's his ministry, you know. We don't always have to be the person leading when we're with somebody. That's kind of a hint, you know. You can pray for that person as they make the decisions and then agree with them in Jesus' name and go and do those things, amen. So we, we came across this place that was like at a bowling alley, pool tables. It was a brand-new place that just opened, and Alex said, let's go in here. I said, okay, let's go in here. And we looked at all the things that people were doing with the video games and stuff, and, and God highlighted an area back in the corner where they were, had pool tables, and there was a bunch of sailors and different people playing pool. He said, let's go get a pool table and play some pool over there. I said, oh, that's, that's a great idea. So we go over there. We start just, one, just asking little questions here and there, but they kind of all gathered around, and the Lord put on my heart just to start asking them, why did you join the Navy? So like the questions that, Pastor Lee had asked the pastors this morning, why did you get saved? What did you come up with? So I, 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 for me, I like listening to people's stories. Now, I don't have to one-up them with another story on top of their story. For me, for me, listening, ministering to someone means that I'm taking the time to hear their heart. Where have they come from? Where have they been in life? What brought them to the Navy? Why are they here right now? And through that conversation, I'm able to share more about what do you, where, where's your faith at? Do you believe in God? You know, these are hard times, you know. Where do, what do you put your trust in? Do you put your trust in the leaders? Because you have to follow those orders. You're in the military. You don't have a choice. You being a captain, Captain Labissier, I always want to call you commander, but now you're Captain Labissier. What, what would happen if some of your people says, well, we don't want to do that, Captain? It's kind of insubordination, isn't it? You're the boss. You're putting out the boss, but you're getting orders from somebody else. So I was kind of asking them these kind of questions, and they asked me, so what was it like you in the, for like you in the Navy to be on a ship? And I said, well, I was on a ship during wartime in the Gulf War, and these are the things we experienced, some of the things we went through, just being relatable to them, small conversation. And at the end of it all, God put up my heart. There was one person that was listening, kind of like the ten lepers that Pastor Elise preached about, there's one person there that kind of highlighted for me. And I went up over to him and I said, hey, if you want to come up to church, go give your number to Alex over there. He'll make sure you give a, get a ride. He said, and he went over and he interrupted Alex. <laughs> he didn't want to forget. <laughs> he said, let me give you my number before I get, because this guy told me that I could come out to church. He hasn't come out yet, but I think he will soon. You know, just keep him in prayer. Just give him the opportunity. Now, I didn't offer that opportunity to everybody who was that room. Because God will highlight who he's dealing with. God will highlight who he's speaking to, who's receptive. And a whole group of people, he'll tell you who he's visiting. Because you're already sanctified. You have the Lord sanctified in your heart, and you're ready to give an answer of the hope that's already within you. You're not giving an answer of what the world says they should, they should do. Yeah. The hope. So let your light shine. In closing, we'll go back to our verse of the day in context, the chapter. I was talking to Pastor Lisa. He was admonishing us preachers to preach more in context instead of just topical, a verse here and there. So I was talking to him a little bit yesterday and texting about some things and ideas, and he was telling me what he was preaching about coming up. So today I'm going to close with Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, that you know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that, would, that are unruly. There's going to be some that are unruly. They're not going to be told what to do no matter what. They're unteachable is what I call them. But you still have to warn them. 
but it's your job to warn them. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but follow that which is good, both amongst yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Whatever sticks in the spirit, hold fast to it. Prove it. Abstain from all the appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, therefore, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word.